60,000 schools in India, he brought about a system of learning where practical learning took uh, uh, a priority over a system of learning of having X number of classes, X number of hours. Rather than doing that, he created a system where practical demonstrations and practical evaluations and participative learning uh, came into the school system in Tamil Nadu. Today, as most of you students know, uh, I am very happy to say that we are probably the first institution to try to experiment with these kind of uh, training methodologies in our, in our uh, higher education. And if we succeed, and I am very confident that we will, we would be a benchmark not only for, uh, for our peer organizations, but for all the organizations above us, including the IITs, IIMs. Nobody is doing what we are doing, and, and we have a great team, great students, I mean, the right ecosystem for this to flourish. And once that happens, we are going to be somewhere. In light of what's happening in the English language also, I think it's going to be greatest relevance uh, in learning is going to be through the methodologies that he has created. And I'm extremely happy that he's accepted to be here with us today to deliver the keynote address. Thank you and welcome. I also extend a very warm welcome once again to all the dignitaries from, from far and near. It's truly an international conference. Often you see international conferences where there are two delegates from the next state. But, but in this case, I'm very happy to see that you come from all over the country and from abroad. And uh, I really hope that that kind of a diversity brings about uh, a dynamic and vibrant uh, uh, interaction among all of you in the next few days. We do a lot of conferences at BIT as part of an institution that tries to go beyond basic undergraduate teaching delivery systems. We go out and national conferences or international conferences or industry institute interactions are part of our agenda. All our departments go forward. But we did have an issue when we started the English language. There was a question, is this directly related to engineering? And after a few deliberations, we decided, yes, definitely there is nothing more relevant. Probably even a technical seminar is not more relevant to engineering education today than proficiency in the English language. As all my student friends would, would agree with me, the make or break when it comes to sitting on the placement table is not the knowledge that is in your head, but in your ability to express it and uh, the confidence with which you express it. And that is purely a function of language. And it is one of the areas where we are trying to put a lot of press, as Dr. Tyarajan said, we have invested a lot in our language labs and we will invest a lot in the programs that are being conducted in the language labs and the programs we are developing in the language labs. And we give a great amount of uh, uh, importance to this. To the extent of saying somebody who absolutely has got no technical skills can still go through that interview if their language skills are excellent. I'm sure everybody would agree with me. So in that sense, your job is absolutely, absolutely relevant in the context of even engineering education, a specialized field like edu engineering education. I'm not sure how many of you would have come from an engineering education background, but in all forms of education, your role is primary today. As all the speakers before me have said, this is the language, the dominant language of choice in the world, and that's the way it's going to be. Up till about 20 years back, French used to compete a little bit in the European area, now they are out. And unless the whole sea change comes and we all start learning Chinese, for some reason or the other, uh, I don't think anything is going to replace English as the language of choice. And the first impression is always the best impression in whatever you do in life. And the first impression comes from communication. I'm sure after 20, 30 years of experience of each person, I don't have to give a lecture on that, but I'm just trying to reiterate the importance of this language in the current context. I will leave this podium with, with just one thought for all the people who are involved in the English language education. You need to actually look at dynamic models new dynamic models, which are tailor-made for the current scenario. The education system, by and large, of taking the English grammar from class 1 to class 12, in 12 years, hopefully everybody should have learned a language, in my opinion, has failed poorly. 80% of the people of this country cannot converse in English in any real sense. Broken English is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real English with real grammar, they are not able to hold conversations, they don't have the ability to use alternative words. And that is a reflection of our current system. Today, in this institute, we are experimenting with what I would loosely call guerrilla 
kind of mechanisms. How do we teach English to somebody in, in, in 20 days, in one week's time, or in a month's time? Now, those are not perfect systems. You cannot completely create a system which is going to work in a 30-day program what you people have been trying to do for about 10 years or 15 years of structured learning. But those are the need for the hour. And I urge each one, every one of you, as you go through your normal, the, the advanced technical discussions on a language which I, I think I'm not really an expert to speak on, as you go through all those discussions, just please keep in mind, it is the user who matters. The user transformation, what you bring about, is the only thing that matters. And please try to create new systems and new forms of delivering this knowledge. So you can actually take tomorrow somebody from, from uh, who just approaches you and transform them to be a complete and competent English speaker in let us say 15 days. If you can do that, you would, have, you, would, you would really start a revolution and you would do a great service to every single person in this country. We have a lot of uh, speakers, I don't want to take up too much time, except uh, to congratulate the team of this uh, uh, conference, headed by Dr. Tyagarajan and all the other faculty of BIT who supported it. Uh, the, the entire turnout, the organizing, everything has, has uh, been up to our expectations and has actually surpassed it. I think it's, it's a great show. Thank you very much for all the team effort that you people have put inside. I invite all the delegates to enjoy the hospitality of BIT over the next three days. And I hope we give you a very memorable experience in addition to the learning experience that you're going to go through in the sessions that are going to happen here. So once again, next time, a very warm welcome to all the distinguished guests and uh, I thank my student friends for also being part, part of this uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We now request our honorable chief guest, Mr. G. Krishnan, journalist and consultant, to release the souvenir of the International, of the International Congress on English Grammar, ICEG 2011, and we also request Dr. Russell Arendt to receive the first copy of the souvenir. Sirs, we now request Dr. Russell Arendt, Rostra Institute of Technology, Dubai, to felicitate. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very honored to be here. I look forward to talking with many different people at this conference. I know we have uh, different kinds of people here. We have teachers, we have students, we have professionals. Um, and I know some of you might be wondering, well, how is grammar relevant to all of these different groups? Well, first of all, we're all human beings. And actually the thing that marks human beings different from other biological creatures on this planet is that we use language. We initiate meaning with other people. We, we interact with other people. We're creative about the use of, of language. The researchers that have studied animals like dolphins and chimpanzees they don't see the level of creativity and initiation that we see with human beings. So this is actually what makes us all common, um, is that we all share uh, a love and a need to use language in our daily lives. Now I know we have lots of different languages represented in this room. Some of those are strong, powerful languages like English. We might call it a T-Rex language, as some people have uh, cited in the literature. Um, even languages like Hindi are also strong languages, Tamil as well. But there are other languages, hundreds, even thousands of them in the world, that we might call minority languages, that are not so strong and powerful, and they're not always um, showing up in, in different spheres, public spheres of life. And yet they are there, and they are part of the human experience. And so as educators, one of the challenges we have as English educators is to find a way to help our students learn as much as they can by showing respect for their backgrounds, whatever languages they happen to know as they walk in the classroom. And uh, there is a way that we can achieve this goal of being fully proficient in English or any other language, and yet at the same time preserve the dignity of the other languages that someone might know. And that's my hope, is, 
as we look at language together, because we are all students, you know, even I'm a student of language. Um, the only one who knows all the languages, I believe, is God, okay? There are 6,000 plus in the world. So as we look at grammar together, I hope you will see that it's actually a very exciting uh, topic and one that there is always new discoveries being made all the time. And as long as we can make it fun and meaningful, um, there's no telling what we can learn and how we can even learn about ourselves as we express ourselves through language. So I'm hoping you will find something of interest at this uh, conference uh, that will connect with your personal interests and your professional interests. And that's my hope for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Maybe in our request, Dr. V. Prakasan, former director, CIEFL, Lucknow, to felicitate. Dignitaries on the days, Mr. Krishna Swami, distinguished guests, and students. I would like to spend a few minutes tracing the history of ICEG. In 1997, we had the first seminar come workshop on English grammar with the help of Sydney University, Australia at CFAC. Second one we had in 1998. When I was planning the third one, you would wonder sometimes principals and vice chancellors can be a problem with their vision and with their ambition. My vice chancellor said, hey, what is this workshop? Call it International Congress. Sir, that will mean more work. Do it. That's why I say, principals and vice chancellors can be a problem. But that gave good results. We had a fantastic International Congress where people, actually people from uh, England and Australia came in large numbers to see whether I can organize it or not. Because we were going to have 30th International Congress on uh, Systemic Linguistics. They wanted to see whether they can give it to India. This is a testing waters. I made a huge first International Congress in English Grammar in 1999. And then for next five years, nothing happened. There came in Bandari Amman Institute of Technology. The second International Congress in English Grammar was hosted by this institution. Please appreciate it. An institution is known to outsiders by two things. By its buildings, laboratories and other facilities, plus the academic beats they host. What happens inside the classroom, you do not know. But outsiders would get to know an institution by these things, the infrastructure plus the academic means. On both these counts, Bannari Amman is one of the leading institutions in the country. And that is exactly, see, last time I came, 2004, this auditorium was not there, but we had enough facilities otherwise. So there's a new one. Inshallah, after five, six years, the next one, they will have another thing to add. That is how an institution grows. Actually, I asked one of the professors, how do you achieve it? They said, our management doesn't may take any profits out. They just pump it back. They build the institution again. They, they spend all the money here to build the institution. On that third front also, this institution is a leading one. And I appreciate the efforts of Professor Chagarajan, uh, Chandra Mohan and other colleagues of his in uh, organizing this uh, Congresses and I would, at, from a personal level, I also express my deep gratitude to them for this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We now request our revered governing council member and honorary advisor, BID, Dr. M.P. Vijay Kumar, to deliver the keynote address. President of the function, Sri Krishnan, Dr. Sundar Raman, Dr. Tyagarajan, Dr. Shamugam, Dr. Russell, Dr. Prakasan, 
Mr. T. K. Armachal. Professor Krishna Sarma. Faculties, delegates, and student friends. At the outset, let me express my gratitude for this opportunity. I'll take about five to ten minutes. I would like to share my views on two, three issues, important issues. Since being keynote address, I need to speak something technical. But I will make it as friendly as possible to the students, to the delegates, and to the faculty members. Now, the importance of English need not be highlighted. It will be like carrying coal to Leveli among the delegates if I try to speak how important the English is. Now, grammar. Should we learn grammar formally? If so, what is the status? Where do we stand? And, and where do we stand and where do we go from here? Now, should we learn grammar formally? Is it necessary to learn grammar formally? We all know that all our students, all our children learn to speak their mother tongue fluently well at the age of five or six. But they don't sit in grammar classes formally and learn grammar. For that matter, they don't sit in any language class to acquire language. It is acquisition of language. Unconsciously, spontaneously, children learn to speak well at the age of five or six. Nobody teaches them grammar, how to speak. And they don't commit mistakes as well. They don't commit any grammar mistakes. They don't make any mistakes in tenses. They speak well. Then why should we teach grammar for anyone? If children can learn grammar without anyone teaching, everybody should be able to learn. But the problem is, such an acquisition takes place only up to the age of five or six that unconscious learning, spontaneous learning of language takes place only up to the age of five or six. If anybody wants to learn later either the same language or any other language, they need to learn. So there's a subtle difference between acquiring a language and learning a language. So what happens before five or six is acquisition of language. What happens afterwards is learning a language. Just consider these sentences. There is there is a lot of problem, there is a lot of difficulty in understanding your arguments because you are not consistent on your tenses. If somebody say like this to you, if somebody say that subjects verb do not agree. And there are a lot of run-on sentences, incomplete work, incomplete sentences. How do you feel? Suppose you write an essay. Suppose you write an article. Let us say you are in yeah, notes of lesson or a paper. You write a small piece of your paragraph. Somebody says this, that your verb, your subject does not agree with the verb. How do you feel? See, the, language, the communication is very, very important in the sense the clarity on writing, why writing, any form of communication. Clarity on writing, clarity on communication is very important. That gives self-confidence, that boosts the self-esteem of a person. If you can speak well with clarity on grammar, with clarity on English, it boosts your, your self-confidence. Now this is for any person who wants to learn after six or seven, any language, especially English as a second language. Therefore, a formal learning of grammar is imminent, it is imperative, we can't escape from that. If you want to speak well, if you want to write well, with clarity, learning grammar is very important. Now grammar. The rules of grammar and spelling is like traffic signs, like those lane markings. 
everyone need to understand and clear about traffic rules. Now what happens we abandon them? There will be complete chaos. Similarly, if grammar is not followed, there will be complete chaos. But that's what is happening and we tend to ignore it. Now please assume that a small change in a comma in a medical literature on the instructions to how to use a, a medicine will be disastrous, will be a health disaster. It will cost many lives. A small comma in a contract of a company will make the company bankrupt. Therefore, grammar is very important for clarity, for clear understanding, for articulation of one's thought to somebody. This is how the importance of grammar. Now having said that, if I say a person who knows grammar will also be proficient in English, it is wrong. Knowing grammar may be necessary, but it is not sufficient. What is more important is personal practice. What you read, how you read, what you write, how you write is equally important. So knowing grammar is important and practicing the language is, is more important. Knowing grammar is not sufficient. You may, you may know the grammar well, but you may, not, you may not be able to use idiomatic English. You may not be able, able to use high uh, mastery in the subject. If you want to acquire mastery in the subject, if you want to speak well, write well, you need to know English grammar very well. Besides grammar, you need to practice well. Now, this is where the importance of grammar is. But what is happening in our country? There have been a number of results, number of survey results which indicate that up to primary level, nearly 70 to 72 percent children are not able to read and write fluently well, not speak after five years of schooling. But even in college level, 50 percent students are not able to write even five sentences clearly without grammar mistakes. What does it mean? As I mentioned earlier, our students have inherent potential to learn because they learn the mother tongue fluently well without anyone teaching, which means capacity of the child to learn is natural and universal. But notwithstanding this capacity, even after 10 years of teaching English, if students are not able to pick up English well, there is something wrong in the methodology, there is something wrong in the classroom.